Hello, everyone. Welcome to eLearn Chat. Maybe. I'm Rick Zanotti, and I am joined today by my good friend and co-host, it's Leslie Price. She's coming to us from just outside London, where they are sort of locked down, though her area is not too bad. And uh, she works with uh, learnappeal.org.uk. We always talk about Learn Appeal. It's a great charity, and I know they haven't been able to do as much this year, but we were trying. And I think our guest just came. Universal line for you. I know. Hey, Rick. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. I'm so sorry. Um, I just got out of a meeting. so my Oh, no problem. Phone. We understand. <laughs> um, so anyway, we actually started the show early. We didn't know if you'd be coming or not, so we, we started anyway. We started anyway. Um, so we are having an e-learn chat, and our guest just got in. It's Andrew Hughes from Designing Digitally. So, Andrew, welcome Hi. to the show. Yes, I'm so sorry, everyone. I just uh, jumped out of a meeting, and um, hello to everyone from uh, nice, cold Ohio. And uh, as you can see, this is my makeshift mask for now. Um, and uh, behind me, um, I'm in one of our conference rooms, and uh, it's uh, nice and quiet. There are only three of us here today out of the 20 of us. Ah, that's good. That's good. And yeah. it probably is. You're in the Cincinnati area? Yeah, uh, in between Cincinnati and Dayton, um, oh, okay. uh, right off of I-75. Uh, yep, I know the Burrow, area. Um, uh, Franklin area, about 20 minutes from Wright Path. Yeah, it's nice out there. I know the area well. Do you? Are you yeah, I've been out there. We have, we have one large client out there uh, who just closed their offices there, but they're, they're still all working remotely. Um, but yeah, so we've been, we've been out there quite a bit and, and we used to work quite a bit with Lectora in the old days. And so we went to Cincinnati every so often for either a show or something else or just a visit. So yeah, we know they are. I like Cincinnati. It's kind of a cool place. Yeah. The Trivanus people were buddies of mine. I've known them for uh, quite a few years. Um, and so, uh, they, they then moved the customer production side down to Florida. So that yeah. kind of a history of how long I've known <laughs> those guys. Yep, Good yeah, guys. that's what they're still at. And they got acquired by eLearning Brothers. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. What, about six Andrew, months ago, Congratulations maybe? to Andrew and the team over there for acquiring Lectora. Mm -hmm. So John Blackman is still there designing. I, I know John well. You probably know John pretty well. Yeah, yeah, I know John. John, Yeah, I like those guys. Um, Andrew and his team are always really, they've always been open arms, really nice guys to us. Um, and we um, have, uh, Andrew and I have had a lot of business conversations because uh, he, he's just an open person like I am. And, uh, he, you know, he's come to me and be like, man, this has been really tough with us building this or that. And I'm going to funny because we're having that same problem. So it's been nice to be able to have somebody in the industry um, to at least have some of those open conversations with. And Andrew's been one of those. Yep. That's good. That's good. And, and. You, you, Leslie, and I have a friend in common with Ajay. He recommended you to the show. He goes, do you know Andrew? I go, no, I don't think I do. And he goes, well, you need to meet him. And that's when we, when we invited you. But uh, <clears throat> he, Oh, uh, I love Ajay. He is such a great guy. He is. Um, and his wife and Leslie are related. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, his uh, wife is a Hughes, and um, uh, yeah, we're, we're a distant a, relative. The, 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 the relationship my mind. is... Um, and, uh, it's it's through Kirkwood, so my grandmother my, on my grandmother's side or my grandfather's side from Scotland it was Kirkwood, and it's the same with her family. They're Kirkwoods, and we worked out that our families actually came from the same part of of Scotland. So we are wow, we are cool. actually we are actually related. Too cool, and, and you're Better and you're related cool. to her on the Hugh side. Uh, she's a Hugh, so we tease each other and said we have to be related to maybe somehow somewhere. Because, yep. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, no, my family's it's not Welsh, like it's not and, like um, being a Kirkwood uh, from not, Scotland. <laughs> Hughes can come. Hughes can come from anywhere. Kirkwood is <laughs> a Welsh. real Scottish name. Believe it or not, um, I know for a fact we're Welsh because my um, great grandfather. Uh, fled um, Wales um, it, at the beginning of World War One in fear that um, 
they'd be taking over whales. And mm -hmm. so we have all the documentation of him jumping on a boat um, and him and my great grandmother and coming over here. And then believe it or not, you know where they ended is in Northwest Ohio. There's a huge Welch community oh, in Northwest Ohio hmm. and that's where they ended up. So, um, and then my grandfather and my father, so fourth generation uh, away from uh, being an immigrant. Oh, yeah, I've, got, I've got quite a lot of family in um in the states so i've got a i've got cousins that live over there that um i and one of my uncles my great uncles um during world war one he met um americans during the war and they told him what it was like in america and so he went to america thinking he was going to be a cowboy <laughs> He went, honestly, right. he went to America thinking he was going to be a cowboy. And I've got, uh, he started off in um, the Bronx. So not exactly, cowboys in the Bronx, yeah. you know, in the 1920s, <laughs> not exactly the best place to live in New York. And he graduated from the Bronx <laughs> to Queens. So he was going up a bit. And then eventually he ended up down on um, on Long Island um, in Oceanside. So he, he, they, the family Ocean's ended up well, in a Queen, nice, Queens in is a actually nice in, part. Now, Queens is actually in Long Island, which a lot yeah, of people don't realize. Yeah, but they ended realize. up even yeah. further. They ended up going to to Oceanside, further you know, in. which is which <clears throat> yep. is quite which is which is quite posh, but. Uh, you know, I tell I tell other Americans that during the 1960s, my um, his daughter, so my auntie Mary, came over from the states during the 1960s, and uh, they had made their money by then, and she came really? to visit wow. my family. We were living in a village in Scotland, just outside Edinburgh, and but they had made their money. And she arrived in a chauffeur-driven limousine, Whoa. and she had purple hair. <laughs> Whoa! Back then, so huh? you can imagine <laughs> in a small village, in the, a, a very it. small yeah. village, in you know, in town Scotland, and this this lady turns up with a very loud American accent, all dressed up to the nines, in a chauffeur-driven car hmm. with... I mean, she'd obviously, she was elderly, so it was grey hair, but she'd had a purple rinse. So as far as my friends were concerned, there's an American lady, she must be a millionaire, and she's got purple <laughs> hair! <laughs> <laughs> I love that! That is a cool story! And you know, and it just it, been, it, what, it embodies the American. 1965, yeah. 66. Huh. Yeah, people didn't really wear purple hair in those days either. Um, no, no. Yeah, interesting. So, Andrew, no, you've got a, a, a real eclectic background. I was looking at what you've done and stuff. It kind of reminded me of me the way I've done things. You were IT guy. You you spent yep. time in IT. You've got a design background. Uh, I didn't really. I just had an interest in it, and um, and you also got your MBA, so you're in, into the business side of things, which is good. It's real important. And so, how did you wind up in the e-learning world? That's a really good question. Um, so um, there's kind of a backstory. What ended up happening is uh, when I was in high school, I lived in a rural area. And they allowed. I'm sorry. No, nothing. Oh, I, I thought I cut out. Sorry. Um, I lived in a rural area, and they didn't have a lot of opportunity. So what ended up happening is I actually was one of the first post-secondary students in Ohio um, to go to college when I was in high school, and I ended up going for uh, to a local community college that's now called Rhodes. 
um, for networking. Um, and at that time, it was the only kind of technology type of things that they had. And uh, while there doing the networking, I actually helped set up at our local uh, telephone company the uh, high speed or at that point dial up internet where we uh, leased a T1 line into a computer. And I think I had like 30 modems connected and we were all sharing that one T1 line and everybody would yeah. dial in to a number and uh, basically set up the internet there. And the county superintendent of the educational service centers and some of the state uh, people had gotten wind that this kid did this and um, I actually left um, the telephone company and worked for the educational service center where I did tech coordinating for nine district schools hmm. and I was building things in like uh, JavaScript and HTML file or HTML at that point where um, director had just come out and um, then serving the county schools and at the same time, because of that, since I was doing that for about five or six years, I knew I wanted to do something in interactive media, and I really wanted to do like 3D animation. Um, but when I went to undergrad, uh, after uh, completing the network degree, I graduated from high school and um, my associate's degree at the same time. And then I went to Bowling Green State University, where uh, I walked in as a junior, so I wanted to do interactive media, and I realized college is awesome. Why would I want to leave in two years if I could stay for four? <laughs> so I double majored in graphic and interactive media. And before I graduated, I was hired by Applied Learning Labs in Northwest Ohio, um, and all I did was develop out e-learning things like um, uh, Athena, um, uh, Echelon, Procter Gamble, and it was all because they made these really, really cool um, orientation maps. They're one of the map companies that mm -hmm. will come in and make you a custom map about how to onboard people at, you know, um, Wellstar Health or something like that. And what they needed is they didn't have anybody to actually build about the e-learning, and Flash 1 was at that time. And I happened to show a bunch of people Flash 1, but in college and I went back home and did a workshop for a bunch of kids and showed them Flash 1 and what you could do with it and how you can animate with it and um, this so happens when I did that fun workshop just volunteer there was a state director of the uh, Department of Education was there standing in the back and um, so what happened is after undergrad I was working at Applied Learning Labs um, I left there and moved to Cincinnati and started working at ThinkPath, which um, mm. I was a contractor for General Electric. So all I did is work at the T GE turbine engine plant for a couple of years, building out training with engineers um, right when the GE90 came out. So mm. um, at that time, we were using HTML and JavaScript to develop out all the e-learning and AICC coding and you know all that good stuff. Um, and what happened is... Um, I went to work for GE directly, and I went to my boss and asked about that. And they, the following day, I was asked to come back in and sign a non-compete. And I said, I don't, I don't sign non-competes. Um, and uh, I quit. And when I quit, I gave a phone call to the Art Institute of Ohio, Cincinnati, and asked, um, do you need any instructors? And they said, we're just starting an interactive media department. Would you like to be the first instructor? And I said, sweet. And then... Um, I called that uh, my mentor, which is Scott Waltower, and he's been like a second father to me my whole life, and it's played in a situation, and he said, you're not going to believe this, the um, the guy that was standing in the back of watching you do Flash 1 just won a $15 million grant to do games for kids. I wow. think you should give him a call. Huh. And so I called him, and um, he just so happens to be from my hometown too, which is a very, very small town, and he's made uh, something big of himself, and he's Dr. Tim Best. And um, he said, what are you doing for the next five years? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. And he said, uh, come join me. And I joined him as an independent consultant. And what we did is we were building curriculum and training for uh, all over the United States for kids in K-12. through And um, we did our first year and had to go back to the Department of Education for an evaluation. When we did, um, they loved it. And they said, we need 10 times more. And I went, uh, I can't do that. And so my... Uh, Dr. Best said, you probably need to start a company and mass produce these for us. And uh, that's how Design and Digitally got started. And um, on top of that, I 
I work for uh, Higher Learning Commission doing curriculum evaluations, and um, I teach at the University of Cincinnati in the Business Law Tech Department. That's great. And so I run Designing Digitally. And that's that's, kind of that's a great story. The long yeah. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, don't you. worry. I'm also, by background, I'm actually also um, a teacher. So oh, I started, oh, I, love- um, I, I, you know, worked in marketing and then got in, then had children and I wanted to go back to work. I, so I'd, I'd worked in marketing and running businesses and running, you know, I was senior office manager, so I'd done all that. And I wanted to do something when I had, my daughter was nine months old and I saw an advert in the local paper where the local yeah. community college were looking for people who had experience <clears throat> in the workplace to go in and teach in marketing, business, and economics. So that's when I started, and I started doing that, what, in 1985? Yeah. Um, when, and, and, you know, technology was just beginning then. Um, I mean, I'd already operated a computer. I'd operated, I first operated a computer back in, oh, 1974, 1975. Um, but we were using these great big laser discs in the 1980s. And then in the 1990s, the internet was invented. And so at the college I was at, um, got a connection to the internet very, 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 very quickly. And so I then started using it. I learned to create e-learning and started using it with my students and then kept going and banging on the principal's door and saying, why isn't everybody doing this? Why isn't everybody doing this? Everybody should be doing it. Until eventually said, oh, for goodness sake, okay, go and be on the strategy group. And then I kept going back, banging on his door saying, but the strategy group aren't doing enough. He said, (laughs) okay, right, you run it. You just run it. So you just do it. So yeah, I did. (laughs) And then I I ended up not only running it for the college, I ended up running it for the, 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 the area what you would call a state we call you know a number of different counties so i ran it in the east midlands area and then eventually after that i then went and advised government so my job was then to advise government and um i love hearing your story because you know what i just heard is you are a go-getter and your bosses acknowledged that over the years yeah yeah and yeah I love to hear that because um, uh, as we continue down the route of training uh, children uh, to become, you know, uh, workers in society, I think it's our responsibility to instill that discipline in them too. And sometimes yeah. it can be very hard. Yeah, I mean, you, there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And one of the things that the, the certainly the, the principal of the community college told me was that if I was going to run this in the college, it had to be done properly. And if it was going to be done properly, it would mean that I had to give up my teaching because my job would then be to train the teachers. So I'd be training the trainers, if that makes sense. There's something about being in a classroom, though, and I state that because oh. I, uh, my passion has always been educating, um, and that's to back to Rick. Um, I find it enjoying to see a connection happen in someone's brain, where yeah. you know you see the synapses here and neurons connect, and some that I got it. Um, that's always been a joy to me. The that light and, bulb. Um, the light bulb moment. Yeah, I also like, um, I like entertaining, so uh, my classes were always just a high energy and a lot of fun because, um, I don't know, I've always been, I've always been that way, and my mom was always like, could you stop dancing, could you stop goofing, <laughs> so um, something I've always liked to do, I guess. It's interesting because, um, do you have any children? 
I do have a, a six-year-old and a two-year-old. And so, and to give you guys an idea, um, I waited as long as I could to have children. <laughs> I put that off as long as possible. And it's nothing against my kids. I love my kids. But one of the things that I realized as a human being is that um, the older you get, the more emotionally intelligent and financially sound you are. And so uh, my wife and I made the structured decision to wait um, as long as we could. But now, having a six-year-old and a two-year-old, um, uh, I'm pretty exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> no, no the, the reason I ask is because my daughter is a primary school teacher. Oh, and I'm beautiful. sure it's one of these things that gets in the blood. Yeah, it is. I, and I love little kids like that as long as I don't have to put them to bed. I love little kids. That whole yeah, fight well, to you, bed thing. Can you imagine oh, having 30 well, of 37 year olds in a class every day? Because that's what my daughter teaches. Not a cat <laughs> in hell's chance would I do it. <laughs> okay, so this is one thing that I did observe. And this is an observation of life about education and about the demographics of kids, okay? Um, I had the opportunity to do some substitute teaching at the uh, K through 12 side. I've had the opportunity in my career to teach at the higher ed side. And then um, I also, back in the town that I'm from, for 15 years, I did a technology camp for middle school kids. That's what I was saying about going back. Um, and here's what I've learned for anybody that um, can relate. Um, middle school kids still have a fear of authority. So if you're like, hey, don't do that, you're like, ugh. College students are paying for it, so they know they have a stake in the game. High school kids do not care. At <laughs> all. <laughs> they are like, I am too cool for you. I don't really want to be here. You're making me do this. And so for me, I have to be honest, hats off to all the high school teachers. High school and junior high, I think, are some of the hardest. But at least junior high, they still have the fear of authority. <laughs> well, I, I, loved, I loved teaching. The age group I loved teaching was the 16 to 18. Because really? if you can... Yeah, I love teaching that age group. Because if you can get them on board, if you yeah. can get them on side, they are the most enthusiastic group ever. They, they, and also, they're very, very good at if anybody in the class, if they're getting on and they're doing it and they're enjoying it, if anybody in the class starts messing about, they're the ones that will say, you can't behave like that. Down. We're wanting to get on. We're wanting to do stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. We'll sort you out at break. <laughs> You know, it's funny you say that. I saw something the other day. It was a video recording on social media of somebody that recorded a class, and they did it as a social experiment where the teacher was recording, but she stepped away for a moment. And it was grade school kids. And it was interesting to watch the psychology of that because what happened is you had all the kids be like, the teacher's not here. Well, we better be good because I think this is being recorded. <laughs> and then one could be like, uh, you know, do a funny thing. And then another one would chime in and be like, don't do that. They're going to know and you're going to get in trouble. So don't do that stuff. And it was just, it was mind blowing because these are just, you know, younger middle school kids that haven't had experience of doing these types of things. And it was just interesting to see the group think in the, the pod like or the, the tribal um, yeah. community, the village thought process behind it happening but it was fascinating because she the teacher did it as a social experiment to see how long it would you know wow. how long they could wait out before somebody would just completely just do something ridiculous and they they waited the entire oh, I, I, time i remember when i, I was in sixth it, grade i went to uh, to a catholic school in new york and there were about 50 boys in one class all boys and the girls were in a separate building in the school so we we weren't allowed to mix but all of a sudden, the teacher said, I have to go for a moment. I'll be back. So the, the, the monk, it was a monk, left the room, and all hell broke loose. It's like oh, yeah. spitball fights, things, books flying out, things flew out the windows. It's like, oh, gosh. And all of a sudden, he walks in, everybody just calms down, like, hi, nothing happened. And then the principal <laughs> showed up. principal walks in with books, pieces of paper, 
all sorts of stuff that had been thrown out the window by accident. And, and I remember one piece of paper had my name on it. I went, oh, no. And then they brought us all, five of us got brought up to the front. We were the perpetrators. We were just part of the 50, but uh, uh, it was not fun. But if they had filmed that, then it would have been a great example of, of savage behavior within seconds. It's like, what, what happened there? It was this instant. Boom. It's amazing right. what kids would right. do. Yeah, but it, it, I think it works. I think it can work both ways. Yeah. Certainly, <laughs> I, we, in the UK, we've got um, a charity that's been running for a long, long time called Children in Need. And it's, it runs every year. And there's programs on the TV and all kinds of fundraising. It's a national thing for, you know, children who are not well off. And I used to get, because I ran this, you know, business, marketing, whatever, I used to get the students in my class to do something for children in need. And that was wow. what, you know, that was what they had to do. And they could choose exactly what they wanted to do. They could all, you know, do the And um, if, if they managed to get... Um, over a certain amount of money in the class, the college would then donate additional funds to it. And it. if they got in the local newspaper, so if they got the community college mentioned then in the newspaper, again, the principal of the college donated additional funds. And it became an amazing thing for the, for the young people that they they managed to do it every year and they got in the local newspaper every year and it was the money they did it and it was them doing it for themselves i wasn't having to moan at Force them it. and doing that they it was suddenly they took responsibility you know, that's an interesting uh, thing. I will share one that I know of that's happening in the local town that I'm at, and hats off to this. This is Monroe Primary School in Monroe, Ohio. Um, it's where my uh, son goes to school. Uh, but what they do is the junior high wrestling team has set up this program called Rent a Wrestler. Hmm. And what they do is over the summer, you can rent a wrestler. Um, it's $10 per kid. And I think they had eight going to the kids but every two dollar or every hour two dollars went into the general fund <laughs> and what it did is it paid for the travel for the kids for the year it has paid for the ability yeah. to get chemicals and everything um, and allow them to be even more self-sufficient but also it did something really really awesome it helped the entire community with all the people that we have, especially in the United States, we have a big influx of, of baby boomers that now need assistance with things around the house and things like that. Um, but it, then it also instilled discipline and work ethic in these kids um, and kept them out of the trouble over the summer. And that program, in my eyes, has been just absolutely excellent. And uh, every time I get to hire those kids for anything, now I'm just even lazier than I was before. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> gardening? Wrestler. Oh, I need something hauled? Wrestlers. <laughs> you know, that's a so, great program. That that sounds like an absolutely great program. And it fantastic. keeps the wrestlers in shape. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important. And I think a lot of young people, What what I don't know if you've also found this, Andrew, but a lot of young people have never, although they've experienced technology, so, you know, they're on their phones the whole time. They're on their tablets their, you know, their TV is connected to the internet. They've got internet at home. They've got all of this. And yet they don't actually know about digital design. They don't oh, know they don't. about yeah. e-learning. They, no. they, I don't no. know how they think it gets made or how it gets created. But, no, you know. No, you're right. I often see, and if we're gonna, if you want to talk about that route, I, I have a whole lot on that that you're gonna love to hear. The first thing that I want to state that is one of the biggest um, frustrations for me is that when, and, and this is across the board, I've seen this all over the globe. I've seen this in federal, um, corporate, nonprofit associations, state, and local governments. They all look at it as in like, what does it cost me for this course? Hmm. But when I look at the actual task items that we have, 
the analysis and the consulting that has to go into it just to make you something that is going to be profound and impactful for your course takes just as long, if not longer, than the actual development of the course. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, um, that's one of my biggest soapboxes, is um, if you're actually going to do something in, in the e-learning realm that uh, you want to make an impact for, you got to give time for that analysis, and you have to understand how valuable you know, your professional analysis, your learner, your stakeholder, um, your skills gap, um, and even your scope analysis, how important those, those, that material is and what solving is. And it's heartbreaking because I see that across the board that um, while we talk about it a lot, um, it's often always just looked at of what does this cost for this course? When you and I both know if I'm going to teach a 16-week course to students, I have 80 if not 120 hours of prep time before the first week starts. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, that, and I'm just going week by week on the course. That's not me setting up all 16 weeks either. And so the same thing on a corporate side. If I'm trying to solve a business problem for you, um, I need time to analyze the external KPIs, your your intrinsic and extrinsic uh, influences. Um, where, how are we going to see this as a success for the stakeholders and the learners? And then how are we going to are we going to be able to have the opportunity to track this um, and be able to prove that with the Kirkpatrick model to you? Yeah. Or are we? Just how, how do you measure it exactly? Yeah. How do you measure it afterwards? So it's not just it's not just Nine, the measurement before. It's the measurement afterwards, and it's not, you know, Rick had this up on both um, on LinkedIn and on Twitter, because with me, my, my saying is, you know, if you're measuring bums on seats, you're measuring the wrong end of the learner. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. I just think that's that's part of the problem, and, and, and it applies equally well in, in community colleges, in schools, and also in um, higher education. You know, in universities. I, think, I think it's so funny when I hear people state, well, we do the ADDIE model. Hmm. And I go, okay, what do you do for the E model or the E part? And they're like, uh, 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 so you're, you're not doing that ADDIE part. You're, you're doing ADDI. And so um, the E is vastly overlooked. And, and the first A is vast. It, everyone thinks it's a small letter in size six font, <laughs> yeah. and it's not. It's how we figure out the business aspect. And even if, uh, even if, let's say, um, uh, like you were talking about uh, Rick with a client, um, let's say that client's already started the analysis and kind of has a sense of that. Um, what I often tell them is, look, we've all been in a bad relationship in our lives. And we might not have known that was a bad relationship and our friends knew it and they might have hinted towards it, but you didn't listen to them and you had to walk, work through that bad relationship until you realize what a good relationship is. Um, in that same situation, we're able to give an outside point of view. So a lot of times we hear from people, why well, do you have my storyboard ready, which is just a, their PowerPoint presentation. It's not an actual storyboard. Or uh, we did an analysis and this was a results and it'll be this is what we want to train on not the results of the feedback from an actual doing the um, listening sessions or doing survey pieces or actually uh, you know doing the investigation uh, so there are just some miscommunication pieces I think that I see quite a few in the analysis and the lack of e that we just mm -hmm. don't do in the industry well, you know it's but interesting think, when you when you talk to sometimes VPs of learning or directors or whatever and, and they'll tell you something like, why well, train 10,000 people this year? My comment is, and how did the performance increase? Uh, yeah. You get that little sound there. And, and they go, did, did you, how about the KPIs? Did you meet any of the KPIs for the company? What's a KPI? And yeah. you just go, oh, I hear ooh, that. ooh, that's bad. Uh, so they mm -hmm. have no groundwork or, or, or foundation in business to start. And so what they're doing is developing training, but they don't know why. It's just somebody had a need, so we developed that training. Well, how does that need fit with the company? I don't know. Um, and, it, and it just You're causes right. that whole situation of, okay, so you trained a lot of people, but you have no idea what their performance was. There's that E again. Um, so what are you doing? Well, well we tracked you know, what they did. What did they do? Well, they passed. Okay. And what does that mean? 
uh, that they passed. And yeah. so that's they went real round common. And round about. Very common. You want to know a funny thing that you that I stage right there? There's a couple things to piggyback on that. You're right about, and I'm not saying this all for training directors, but I want to tell you that I've I've gotten to know a lot of training directors in this industry, and a lot of them um, feel a lot of pressure from mm-hmm. people above them. And a lot of times what I see is, and it's not their fault. So I right now, training directors, you're listening to this. I'm backing you up here, guys. A lot of times you're left out of some of those strategic decisions That's and true. you are provided that you need to make a training on this. And then you blindly go into it or come to us and say, I was told we need training on this. Well, why? Well, I was given that information. Right. And so how can we benchmark this? And well, I don't know that because I was basically tasked to do this. So for them, I also think that from an executive and business role, they need to let those training directors come to the table some more. Mm-hmm. Yep. And actually understand the business impact. And here's one thing that we are do here at Designing Digitally, and this is not in a negative way. It's a way to just get a mind, mental mindset on how it should be handled. You have to justify your department. How do you justify your department? By being able to say, this is the expense of us on the line item, and this is the value and the results mm-hmm. and the impact we have made. Yep. If you can't do that in your department, you should not be a department head. Yep, good point. Because at any time your department heads or your directors should be able to justify their existence at all times. I and mean, so I totally, can, I totally, totally and utterly, to so. totally and utterly agree with you. I mean, part of, I've always said part of the problem with learning and development, training and development, is that very often it sits back office behind HR. So the HR people are at the top table, but the people who are responsible for the learning and the training are not at the top table. And they should be at the top table along with the people who are actually delivering, you know, who are delivering whatever whatever the company is delivering, you know, whether it be, um, you know, whether it be a service or whether it be, you know, I don't know, clothes pegs or, you know, at this time of year, Christmas baubles or, or whatever, <laughs> you know, they should be, the people who are involved in training and development should be on the front line. 100% agree with you because here's the thing that I do not understand. I was a football player, a wrestler, a rugby player for a D1 college, right? That was another reason why I stuck around for four years. You know, you short, stocky guy. I work really well as a hooker for um, rugby. Hooker for rugby oh, is rugby's, a rugby's for any the right game. Asking. It's a rough game. Yeah, trust me, I'm paying for it now. Um, <laughs> I know. I knew you were on the other side of the pond. That's why I brought up rugby. Um, and so w- this is my mental thinking. My mental thinking has been you build a team. And you're not playing a sport. You're playing a survival experience. These people that I picked to be on my team are composed to help build services that then provide us a standard of living for the economic society that we're in. So if I, my mental thinking is that we are a sport, why wouldn't I want my coach to train and improve my team for the sport of survival? Mm-hmm. That should be one of the highest priorities in my mind. I've seen an educated staff be one of the most effective staffs I've ever seen. Uh, an enlightened staff be one of the most productive staff I've ever seen. But the thing is, is like you stated, it's not valued that way because there's not a way to – we've had for so many years no direct way to say this has made an impact. And now with us at being able to implement more analytics – and if we can get those people more to the table so that they know the business um, impacts and the actual KPIs, instead of, like you're saying, being directed by HR as a taskmaster to build these courses, then you're going to see a big evolutionary change. Mm-hmm. The other problem I have, guys, and I tell you this because we have a major problem when it comes to analytics and, and e-learning. Here's the problem that we had. And I'm sorry to go on a soapbox, but um, this one's a big one. 
back in the day, we had um, HTML and um, a JavaScript. Then Flash came out, and we all developed in Flash. And we had this model in L&D of developers and instructional designers. Then what happened is we had software come out, um, uh, such as things like Storyline, um, Captivate, um, iSpring, Lectora, that allowed the instructional designers to start um, clicking around and making user-friendly experience. The business side realized, and as a business owner, I get it, why would I pay $30,000 for you and $30,000 for Rick if you can do the job for $40,000 and I save myself twenty grand? And so we had this fundamental shift in business to where we now have eliminated the programmers and developers from the L&D mm -hmm. e-learning development and put it on the teachers and the educators. And when we did that, it's worked well, and we've been able to learn how to develop in digital design. But the thing that I see is now all of a sudden with these analytic pieces, we actually have to get back into coding and development where we don't have the programmers anymore. And we're slowly seeing the adaptation of XAPI all over the board. Mm -hmm. But the reason why you didn't see rapid adaptation is because you do not have the technically inclined building all of the e-learning courses no. um, themselves. So it's been a slow adaptation unless you have a staff of developers and instructional designers that can program and develop that. And we eliminated that in the industry when, and we slowly did that to ourselves. And now what I see are a bunch of instructional designers that are underpaid, underprivileged, and are now the writers, the analysis people, and the developers of the courses, in which um, why we have such a hard time with yeah. um, implementation of XAPI mm -hmm. and things like that, because you've got to do a lot of coding. Um, and granted, you can hit the export out with XAPI coding on it on the two programs, but you're just going to see what they clicked on and just give you default statements. If you actually want to be able to show KPI data or track them by competency, then you actually have to do some coding. And uh, it's it's something that has been developed above the technical aptitude of the people that we've kind of forced into building these user-friendly e-learning modules. And, and with and, that, we are pretty much out of time and but that, I'm sorry, you, guys. <laughs> that leaves you some food for thought and uh andrew we'd love to have you back on and get a little bit more into this because we we talked a lot today but we didn't get a lot into the meat and matters of what you're doing and stuff like that it'd be more more than fun to hear hear about that and i think we all have really strong opinions of exactly what you said today uh, you know you've got you know we're, you're preaching to the choir with us but believe me that's something that is a big issue out there and boy is it a big issue um so uh, I would love to have you back on. If you're willing to come, you're, you're always invited. I, I would be absolutely honored, and I promise I will not be late. Um, <laughs> That's I'm fine. very sorry that for that. <laughs> that me. And uh, I do want to say to both of you, you guys have been fantastic. Um, thank you both for doing this. Um, it's great. to. I love having conversations with people in the industry. Sorry to go on a couple of soapboxes, but um, I can see just the the passion that you guys have in, and the reactions you guys have to some of the things I said. I think we all kind of feel that same way. And I don't have the answers to those problems. I'm just acknowledging that we have some problems. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, the answers are tough. Um, but anyway, no, we definitely appreciate you coming on, and thank you for the compliment, and and you know, kudos to you, too. You've done some great work and some really interesting stuff. So for all you folks watching, we have Andrew's information below. You can get a hold of him, contact him. Uh, this is right now currently live on LinkedIn, so um, we will also be uploading it later to LinkedIn again. It's also going up on YouTube, and it was live at the same time on Facebook. So... Uh, Andrew's information will be below. You can get a hold of him. Have a good one, everyone. And this is our last show of the season. So, uh, well, actually, we have one more show on Friday, which is kind of a, a special interview that with, with, with a voiceover talent we know that, that does a lot of work with us. But uh, so the, basically, this is our, our last normal show of the season. And uh, we wish you guys happy holidays, Merry Christmas, whatever, just happy holidays. Enjoy yourselves, and let's hope 2021 removes some of the insanity 2020 brought to us. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, Bye everybody. everyone. Thank happy you. Happy Christmas. Bye.